Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Live from the Sword Coast podcast. My name is Kevin Madison, and uh, I won't be your friendly dungeon master this evening. Uh, instead, I am going to um, be providing uh, another review. Um, tonight, I want to take a look at Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, published by uh, Schwab Entertainment uh, and written by uh, Robert Schwab. Um, this is a game that I have uh, mentioned that I wanted to, to review uh, quite a few times on the channel and just have not gotten around to, to actually doing it. Uh, so I thought I would kick off another weekend with, uh, with a review. Um, so um, as with my other reviews uh, on this channel, this is going to be a fairly lengthy uh, process of going through. So um, if you're looking for a short nutshell or a, um, a nutshell summary of, uh, of what uh, I'll be talking about, um, it, it's a, I mean, this is one of my favorite games, uh, both to run and to play. Um, uh, the game is a, uh, in a brief summary, uh, is a horror fantasy uh, role-playing game uh, that uh, takes characters from 0 to 10th level, uh, with each level featuring um, a, a different adventure as you progressively make your way towards confronting the titular villain, uh, the Demon Lord. Um, it has a very uh, D&D kind of vibe to it in some aspects, but it also it owes a lot of its uh, pedigree to the uh, Warhammer Fantasy role-playing uh, system. Uh, the, the, not the third edition that had the, the uh, fun dice, uh, the uh, first and second ed editions. Um, so that's the nutshell version for the, for the more lengthy uh, uh, analysis of this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little context as to what, uh, what you're in for. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, just some general background first. Uh, then I will talk about what's uh, what the game is about. Um, and then I'll talk about the core mechanics of the game, uh, what the underlying system is that drives the, uh, the the game. I'll talk about what you play in the game. Uh, so what kind of characters do you play? Who do you you know? Who are your uh, heroes that you're following in this uh, in this journey? Um, what do you do in the game? Uh, what's in the book? Uh, and then finally, who's this for? So that's sort of the the guideposts that I'll be following as I go through this. Um, so first, as, as general background, um, I got into the game uh, because uh, actually of a review, a review of it that spoke very, very highly of how it was a very, the, the reviewer at the time had uh, compared it to a lot of um, OSR type games that have a bit more of a punishing approach to, um, uh, to heroes uh, that in the sense that they, your heroes aren't, um, necessarily going to survive uh, the encounters if, if they do things stupid or if they bite off more they can chew or if the dice don't go their way uh, characters can die and that is very much the case in the, in this game so I found that compelling um, and uh, I also liked it that the game had sort of set parameters in the core book uh, the game covers as I said from zero level where you're creating a character who has no no uh, they call they're effectively what you would see understand as classes in D d or, or similar games but they're called paths in this and uh, you start off with uh, no paths whatsoever uh, just as characters with uh, you pick a, an ancestry which is like your race or your species uh, and then you have a couple of professions and then you sort of start there so you start as the sort of proverbial you know, uh, farmhand who gets into an adventure and then becomes a hero over the course of the story. Um, and uh, the game caps out uh, in the default rules at level 10, uh, which means that, again, you're going to be playing uh, 0 to uh, uh, to level 10. And that's sort of your, that's the the context in which you, uh, you're you going to be playing your campaign. Um, uh, since purchasing the game, uh, I have been running it for about a year and a half or so. Um, and uh, I've played through in a, a campaign run by my buddy uh, Jared Rasher. Uh, I will include uh, after I uh, post this or after this concludes, I'll post links to uh, uh, to Jared's uh, game, which is a nice tight, you know, eleven session thing. Uh, and I'll include links to the playlist for for my Shadow of the Demon Lord game. Now, mine is way more meandering uh, because that's just it, kind of the game that I run. Uh, so if you want a sense of uh, what kind of, you know, a tight little uh, campaign you could run with this game, uh, take a look at Jared's uh, playthrough, which was a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to see sort of more smelling the roses and kind of getting lost by minutia, uh, then you can take a look at my game. Um, the uh, the uh, core mechanic uh, in the game, well, I guess maybe before I get into that, uh, I'll talk about what 
uh, how this differs from other fantasy role-playing games. So um, unlike other fantasy games that either build themselves as fantasy role-playing games or fantasy horror games or you know dark fantasy games, this is front and foremost a horror game that is set in a fantasy setting. Um, the There isn't, actually, you know, there is, I think, a discussion a bit of horror in this. You know, I've read that, that type of section so many times that I may have skipped it over in this. Um, but... Uh, the game has very um, clear uh, mechanics for things like corruption and uh, insanity, uh, and that is part of the setting. Uh, you know, it's very much um, similar to the old uh, Warhammer fantasy role-playing uh, games, like the the uh, um, the one originally published by Games Workshop, and then the one that was published by uh, Green Ronin. Uh, so, if you're familiar with those games. Um, Rob Schwab sets out those as a specific inspiration for this game. Um, it's also worth saying that uh, Rob Schwab, uh, in his uh, like on his CV, I guess his gaming CV, uh, he has experience with both the fourth and fifth edition of D and D, as well as other things like um, uh, some of the Green Ronin games, like uh, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, so this was his attempt to do his own game, the game that he would want to run that um, includes everything in one book. Uh, and I gotta say that like for, for a core rule book, this is one of the most comprehensive uh, core rule books of, of any game I've ever purchased. There is more than enough in just the core rule book for you to run an infinite number of, uh, of campaigns or to play one campaign for as long as you want. Um, the, uh, the horror aspects of this are also played up in the enemies that you'll be facing and the themes of the of the campaign you'll be playing in. The themes are very apocalyptic. You know, the, the game at default is designed to be run where the world is coming to an end and it's up to your heroes to try and prevent it in the course of their, of their campaign. Um, there are some really interesting rules for shaking up the, um, the, uh, the way that the uh, apocalypse manifests itself. So you can obviously treat this like any other game where you just design that, uh, what that apocalypse would be, uh, or you can, if you want to shake things up, you can use uh, random generation. Uh, for my campaign, uh, I use the random generation uh, system. And uh, for my campaign, what we rolled at the outset was that uh, the Fae had been corrupted. Um, the the Fae play a pretty prominent role in this, like fairies and elves and, you know, uh, boggins and stuff like that. Um, and that's what what the um, of the random sort of uh, options for how the world was going to come to an end. We rolled uh, the fate. So what it was was the favor becoming darker, and that gave me sort of a starting point to design the rest of the campaign. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. I in the past have never used fairies as a um, as a prominent uh, feature in any of my campaigns. To be honest, I tend to veer towards undead a lot just in uh, fantasy campaigns because I like undead and there's less trying to reconcile, you know, why those things are in areas untouched by other people for a long time. But, um, and I just, and also, I guess I think at default, I find fairies kind of silly. So I can't really see them. It, or I shouldn't say that. it's been a challenge to come up with them as a credible threat in this campaign. And that's been a lot of fun. So, uh, and there are, I believe, 10 different options for how the, the shadow of the demon Lord, uh, how it's influence on your uh, campaign world how it manifests, and that can be things like earthquakes, or like the appearance of a giant dragon, or like the disappearance of the sun, or one in ten people transform into beast men, or, or you know, bestial things. Um, and even if you don't want to randomly generate it, uh, you can use those things as an inspiration. Uh, my buddy Jared, when he ran it, uh, he used that just as inspiration. He didn't actually randomly generate it, but he did use one of the themes, which was the collapse of civilization, as the the underlying kind of um, uh, theme to uh, to create his own campaign. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, and that's one of the ways it, it differs. Uh, your characters are, again, subject to corruption, uh, insanity, um, and it, and that's not any small thing. Some, uh, the, the degree of corruption that your car character suffers from can be controlled by the player to a certain degree because you just, you know, don't learn dark magic or don't give, you know, get into pacts with devils for, for extra power. Uh, that's a pretty clear step to, uh, you know, to avoid. Um, but there are also certain creatures like shadows uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the game that, uh, that will actually inflict corruption on you. And uh, corruption 
has a sliding scale on it in this game where you reach a certain point. It's kind of like uh, you know corruption, in, Shadowlands taint actually in uh, Legend of the Five Rings, if you're familiar with that, where the more corruption you get, the more it physically manifests on your character and the more that it you sort of give off this aura of, um, of unsettling you know, uh, corruption, I guess, uh, for, um, to, to other things you meet, like, uh, one of the base levels of, of corruption you hit is dogs and cats, you know, will bark and hiss at you as you pass by. Little kids will cry when you pass by things like that. And then it gets up to a certain point where if you hit a certain threshold of corruption, uh, you will lose your character because your character becomes a thrall to the demon Lord. Um, and again, that's not necessary to say that that's an automatic thing, but you know, it allows you to, it allows you to dabble a little bit and play darker side characters, but it does provide, you know, a, a outlet for if you, um, you know, if you're playing murder hobos, uh, you're going to lose your characters pretty quickly uh, in this game because they will eventually uh, become uh, corrupted. Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the, the backdrop for the game. Um, the core mechanic in the game is uh, you're rolling a d20. Uh, and then you will get, uh, you'll add to that your uh, applicable uh, ability. Um, your abilities are scored from about 10 to about 20. I mean, I'm not sure there's an actual upper limit to it, but it's 10 or higher. If you, uh, for every, actually it can be lower too now that, that I think of it. If your um, attribute is lower than 10, then you take uh, your attribute, you subtract 10, that's your dice modifier. Uh, so for instance, if you have an agility of eight, you will subtract two from all your agility related checks. Um, Similarly, if your agility, if your ability is over ten, then you add the amount that is over ten to your uh, to your roll. Um, the attributes or the abilities don't really scale up terribly high, and because you only have so many levels and you gain only so many um, uh, so many uh, increases over time, the game does remain fairly uh, within a fairly uh, reasonable range. Uh, you do see advancement for your character, but it's not the exponential growth that you see in uh, a game like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, pre-5th edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I mean. Um, the um, the other thing that will be added to your, uh, to your dice roll uh, is uh, either a bane or a boon, or a number of banes or boons. Uh, what those are are d6s that are rolled, uh, and then you take the highest of that and then you either add it to the to the total if it's a boon, or you subtract it from the total if it's a bane. Um, it's which those make for really uh, intuitive mechanics. Like it's really easy to uh, to eyeball if if there's a good situation, give your your character a boon or or a, uh, or two. Um, if it is a bad circumstantial modifier, you give them a bane. And there's a lot of different abilities that will give you boons and banes uh, to different roles. Um, if you have training in a profession. Uh, then you get to add a boon to your role if it fits in that category. So for instance, if your character is, say, has the investigator uh, profession, um, if you're doing anything with any of your attributes that relates to, you know, what an investigator would do, so things like maybe, you know, talking to people in a CD bar trying to get a clue or investigating a crime scene or trying to anticipate where, you know, like the highest level of, of um, smuggling activity might be, all of those things would uh, you would get a boon from your profession, and then that's applicable to whatever profession you want. It's kind of left to the DM and the and the players to decide how they want to implement that stuff. Um, but I, I find that it's it's a very quick um, mechanic uh, at the table. It's, it keeps things moving uh, really easily, and because you're only keeping the highest roll of it, uh, and the dice don't explode like in you know Savage Worlds or or Five Rings or anything like that. Um, it does provide a fairly reasonable range of, um, of results. So uh, the game doesn't really, you know, go to a point where the math seems to break down. It, it still stays consistent. You feel your characters feel more competent and more capable, but it, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't stop being playable at, at a certain point. Uh, so that's the core mechanic uh, of the game. Um, who do you play in the game? So maybe I'm going to dive into the, the book itself a little bit now uh, to talk about what... Um, you know, what decisions you get to make in as a player in this. So um, when you're playing the game, the first thing you will choose if you're playing the game from zero to 10 is you will choose a, a, a ancestry. And the ancestry is what you would recognize as a race or a species in, in any other game. It's things like human or dwarf or changeling or um, elf or fawn uh, or clockwork. Um, in the core book, uh, the uh, ancestries that you can choose from are uh, human, uh, dwarf, uh, changeling, 
uh, orc, uh, clockwork, and goblin. So uh, of those, I mean, the human and the dwarf are pretty much like humans and dwarves in, in any you know game. Um, a changeling is a construct that was made by the fae. Uh, you are a collection of magical twigs and earth and, you know, mud and, and twigs uh, that has been given magical form. And you can transform yourself into, um, to look like different things. Um, the clockworks are what they, you think of. They're sort of like um, uh, a race of artificial beings that have been constructed and infused with a soul. Uh, they, at first blush, they sound sort of like uh, Warforged from uh, D&D's Eberron setting, but to be honest, they're, they're a lot more, there's a lot more variety in them than that. Um, when you're creating your character, you can have a clockwork that actually looks like a little floating sphere with little arms or something, you know, or you could have a clockwork that looks like a, you know, artificial centaur. Um, you randomly generate, or you, well, you can randomly generate, or you can choose uh, what form your character takes uh, and that will dictate what your starting uh, abilities are. So to give you an idea here, this is an example of the uh, clockwork here. So these are these charts here that uh, provide, you know, your clockwork form um, and then other things like your personality, your appearance, uh, your background uh, and so forth. Uh, apart from the form, these tables appear for every single one of the races uh, or I'm sorry, every single one of the ancestries. So uh, when you're creating your character, if you're using those tables, um, you end up with a really interesting sort of, not only a backstory, but a, a, a fully fleshed sort of person or character to, to bring to the table to start playing. Um, you do get to have some agency in it in terms of uh, modifying your abilities. And of course, it's at the DM's discretion if you want to just choose your abilities or choose your professions uh, or choose your form for a clockwork, uh, you're free to do that order to choose your deformity if you're playing a goblin character. The goblins in this are outcast fae. Uh, the, uh, the legendary in the world is that the goblin king stole something from the, from the fairy queen, and as a result of that, uh, his people, the goblins, were cast out of the uh, hidden kingdoms, which is like the sort of the fairy realms. And uh, the, the goblins, as creatures of fae, are all randomly weird things. Uh, so they can, you know, have rat ears or whatever other kind of, you know, uh, weird, uh, random uh, kind of mutation that uh, that you could think of. They also have really bizarre personality quirks too. So there's an element of that dark humor um, in this, uh, or or black humor, I suppose, uh, that you find in the Warhammer universe as well too. Um. What else? The um, so when you're creating your character, as I said, you uh, the each uh, ancestry you pick it provides you with your set uh, uh, abilities, and in this game, there's only four abilities. There is uh, strength, agility, intellect, and will. Uh, there is one derived uh, statistic, which is your perception, um, and uh, well, I guess your health. Your health is your like your hit points in this game. Health is also derived from strength, but it, it gets modified by uh, uh, your paths as you take your, you know, your different paths. Um, and then also there is an ability, if you end up playing a spellcaster, there is an ability called power, which moderates how powerful your ability to influence magic is. So um, when you're creating a starting off character, there is some interesting variety to it. Um, but you, as a player in the rules at a default, really the only agency you get is to pick your uh, abilities. You can raise one ability by one and lower one ability by one. Um, and then you, you start playing. Um, the zero level adventure is supposed to sort of set up, introduce the characters to the like wider world to, to set the tone for what the, the, uh, the struggle against the demon Lord is going to be. Um, the demon lord is sort of described as uh, this creature, this sort of formless, powerful creature that exists in the void that is outside of, of reality. The default setting is a place called Earth, U-R-T-H. And then um, the demon lord is trying to sort of get in and destroy the world. And the way that it does that is through, you know, whatever way that, uh, or I should say, the efforts to try and destroy the world manifest through the sort of theme that you pick for your campaign. Um, the uh, Once you get past that first adventure, 
Oh, one other neat thing is that you you do also roll for two. There's random tables for interesting things. So each character starts off with, uh, I believe it's one interesting thing. So you um, you randomly generate that, uh, and that can be something that's really interesting and character defining, or it can just be some really weird thing that never comes up again. Like I, um, when I played in Jared's game, I played a character who it was a Jotun, who was a um, kind of a half giant type character. And uh, his interesting thing was a bottle of glue. Um, it provided to uh, a go-to joke that we kept going back to for it, but it didn't really do anything in the course of the entire campaign. So um, it can be interesting, can be, you know, um, uh, just a, a, a useless, you know, trinket. Uh, the way that advancement works in this uh, is you don't, uh, you don't gain um, XP or anything like that. You don't track experience points. That doesn't track kills. Uh, when the DM tells you that uh, the party advances, everyone in the party advances. So if the party is level one, that means everybody is level one. If the party is level seven, everyone's level seven. Um, that's an interesting, I, I like that because there's no quibbling over, you know, people missing sessions or things like that. Uh, and there's less tracking kills or tracking small achievements. Uh, so um, to be honest, this is sort of how I run every game anyway. I don't, I'm never really hard and fast on, on experience points, or I don't tend to be. So uh, for a level-based game, this is sort of how I would run things anyway, but it's it's cool to see that that's baked in there. Now, as you advance, the uh, characters are divided into three different tiers of play. Uh, so your first tier of play is your novice tier. That's from levels one to three. Uh, once you hit level three, you enter the expert tier, and that runs from three to six. And then at seventh tier, you uh, enter the master tier. Uh, and then from seven to 10, you're in the master tier. Uh, as you're going through those tiers, at each stage, you will pick a different uh, path. Um, and they start as fairly restricted, and then they get a little further out, and then they get even more out. Uh, so the first tier is your novice path, second is your expert path, and then finally your, your master path. And the abilities you get from each of those different paths is uh, commensurately more impressive and more powerful. Um, the first uh, path you will pick on your novice path, that's what you get at level one, that will be either fighter, rogue, priest, or magician in, in the uh, base book. So effectively, it sort of translates to, you know, fighter, thief, or rogue, um, magic user, or uh, cleric in D&D. In &D. Uh, within each of those, there can be some specialty as well, too. So you do have certain abilities you pick as a warrior. Not a, to start off with, uh, actually, the warrior is probably the least, uh, the least interest. Not interesting. It's the the least amount of customization, at least to start, because you just get a bunch of bonuses to uh, the damage you do and to uh, boons to when you're attacking. The rogue does get to do a lot of specialization. Uh, you can make anything from like you know a second story man uh, or woman. Uh, or to like the arcane, you know, uh, pickpocket type characters, you know, and, and anything sort of uh, in between. Uh, you do that by picking certain of your abilities. Uh, the priest and the uh, magician share one common way of specializing, and that is in your selection of magic. In this game, the way that your, uh, you learn magic or the way the magic system is organized is into different schools. Uh, and there are a ton of schools in the core book. Um, these run the gamut from, you know, clear elemental cognates like air and fire and earth to things like um, divination or curse or destruction or battle or celestial, forbidden, life, necromancy, nature, primal, shadow, rune. Like these are all ones that are in here and there's still more too. song. Um, and it's very, very cool. Uh, each of those uh, you have uh, different tiers of spells as well, running from zero to five, uh, which are just like in other level-based games, that the more the higher up you get, the the more powerful you are, and your selection of your school will really inform what kind of spellcaster you are. You know, if you're a character who learns the arcane and fire and say protection uh, schools, you're going to be a sort of battle wizard type character. Whereas if you're playing a say like the rune and divination and um, um, animal uh, schools or nature schools, uh, you're going to be more of a oracular sort of druidic type character. And uh, 
And it's really interesting because uh, the further you get up, um, the schools you choose can actually influence the way that you say manifest uh, insanity because and insanity manifests in different um, uh, in different ways. Uh, if you are, for instance, uh, someone who is a really trained in uh, the battle school, uh, your insanity when you have a, a, a breaking, you know, and you have to be insane for a bit, it will be battle rage. Uh, it won't be one of the other sort of random uh, options. So, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it, it that it flavors your character in, in that capacity. Um, there are, uh, like I said, a lot of different varieties of schools. So that's one way of customizing. Um, apart from that, there really isn't much in the in terms of the priest as written and the magician as written to further sort of customize your character. So, um, apart from your selection of spells, uh, that's there's not a lot of customization. Uh, the rogue is probably the most um, customizable. So you pick one of those four novice paths, and then that's what you will be playing through for the next two levels. Then at level three, you pick an expert path. And the expert path is uh, a further sort of, well, let me rephrase it. It can be a further refinement of your existing um, uh, your existing thing. So you could go from warrior into fighter, or you go from warrior into ranger, or you can kind of go you know against the grain, and you can pick something else. Uh, there's no restrictions, or there are no restrictions, on your choice of expert paths. So if you choose to play, effectively it will be like a multi-class character in another game, uh, you can easily do that. You could pick Rogue, and then you could pick uh, Paladin, if that was sort of you know the, the character concept you had. Your expert path will give you different uh, abilities. Um, and then as you go up in, in uh, levels, you will keep getting new abilities from the choices that you've made. So as you go up in level, for instance, you will get another ability at level, I guess level five, you get your next novice path ability. And then at level nine, maybe you get your next novice path. I got the book in front of me. So why wouldn't I just look here? Let's see. So your novice path gives you level one, level two, level five, and then level eight. Uh, your expert path will give you uh, abilities at levels three, six, and nine. And then your master path will give you uh, your abilities at level seven and level ten. And you, if you're keeping track at home, you may notice there's one uh, level missing there that you're not getting something from your path, and that is uh, level six, which is when you get something. I'm sorry, level four, which is when you get something from your um, species or your uh, species, your uh, ancestry. Your ancestry will give you an, uh, two different options to pick. Um, usually, it's you know a bonus to uh, to a fighting or a spell or something else that's more thematic, something that uh, links to your uh, your uh, ancestry. An example of that uh, is like the uh, the orcs in this. Um, you get either you get either one spell or you gain this ability called Rising Fury, which is when you take damage, uh, you make your next attack roll before the end of your next round with one boon. So this is the you know or getting tagged, spinning around and furiously taking someone else down. Um, so, and those are usually just, you know, if you go to martial character, uh, you'll get one option you can choose. Uh, and if you're a spellcasting character, you'll get another one. Um, the um, expert paths uh, in the core book, uh, there are 12 of them. Sorry, there are 16 of them. Four, broadly speaking, that, that match up with each of the different um, uh novice paths. And these are things like cleric, druid, oracle, paladin, artificer, sorcerer, witch, wizard, assassin, scout, thief, warlock, berserker, fighter, ranger, and spellbinder. And for the most part, these are all quite good. Um, some of them have seen uh, mechanical revision since the, the core book came out. Like they've redone the way the wizard works. They've redone the way the fighter works. Um, they have uh, a Redone the Paladin very, uh, very minorly, um, and then there are, um, in addition to these uh, expert paths in the core book, uh, there are in the supplements a bunch of other options as well too. So you are never at a shortage of things to consider as a, a player uh, in Shadow the Demon Lord. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna talk about the, the supplements just at the end very briefly because I think I would sooner deal with them in a separate review because there's just there's a lot of material there. So your expert path is sort of the next, the thing that informs the next stage of your character's development, provides a little more specialization, and is likely closer to, it's likely the thing that most that most defines your character, I find. So 
Um, your, your master path will provide a little bit of extra twist to it. Uh, and you can uh, emphasize that by taking something that's against type. So for instance, uh, for my uh, Jotun character, um, Jotuns, so certain races like the Jotun, like uh, centaurs, things that are more powerful uh, than what the average race is, than what humans are or dwarves are, uh, they don't pick a novice path. They have specific uh, advancements they get. That's not in the core book. Now those exist in the core book, but in some of the supplements, there are other races that will advance that way. So you, you don't pick a, a novice path. They do, however, provide you effectively the same types of options where you can create more of a martial character or more of a spellcasting character. So you still have some a degree of specialization in that, but uh, you don't get access to the, to the specific abilities of the novice paths when you're playing one of those powerful races. The reason I mention that is because my sample character, uh, uh, Vigdis, the uh, Jotun, I didn't pick a novice path, so he was a Jotun who went more towards the martial bent, and then as an expert path, I picked Ranger. So for the majority of the campaign up to level seven, he was very rangery. You know, it was lots of wilderness stuff and and uh, some fighting, and and he wasn't so shooty shooty. He was more hit stuff with big swords, but um, th that uh, ranger class is really what informed a lot of his other special abilities. But then at the master path, I actually chose to go with um, this uh, master path called Scald, which was like a battle bard type thing, and. Uh, that just really fit the character. Uh, it didn't augment the specific abilities I had, but it provided such an interesting story twist for it that, um, uh, yeah, that I, I loved that I was able to do that and not be mechanically punished for taking that sort of story option. Now, I should say maybe here that one of the problems, not problems, but one of the things, the pitfalls that you can go into uh, if you are playing a, um, a, a fairly combat-heavy game is there are subpar options in this. So this is not the kind of game where it is idiot-proof in terms of uh, creating a character who is still viable at, in, in combat and able to sort of hold their own at the table. Um, and I don't mean that to mean that, uh, you know, just because someone is more of a CC or like crowd control type character who's doing buffs and debuffs on the enemies um, versus just doing straight up damage. Uh, I mean that you can you can build characters without realizing that really can't do much in combat apart from you know shooting you know arrows and stuff like that that just don't do enough damage. So um, it's if you decide to run the game, it it is uh, I think it's useful to make sure that the players uh, are aware of what their character brings to the table. If there is going to be combat, which it's a horror fantasy game, there's going to be combat in it. Um, maybe just make sure characters know what they're able to bring to the table. That can be, you know, there's tons of spells in here that provide great debuffs. Uh, in our, both my, the campaign I've been running and the one I played in, uh, debuffs have played a great role in helping to mitigate the damage that gets done. Uh, because uh, this game sort of models um, advancement by how big your health bar gets, like how much health you have, how many hit points you have and how much damage you do. So as you get up in, in levels, um, you're sort of expected by the system to be doing a certain amount of, uh, of damage and have a certain amount of hit points in it. Um, if you aren't keeping parity with that, it can dramatically alter the difficulty of the, uh, of the scenes. Um, and if you're not using some of your uh, available debuff abilities to say like, you know, making the lich lose a round or like driving the dragon down to the ground or something like that. Uh, it can really change an encounter from, boy, this is going to be challenging to, whew, what am I going to play now that they're all dead? Uh, so uh, it's just something to, to, to bear in mind that with that freedom of uh, mi mixing and matching your different paths, uh, there is the potential downside to building a character that really can't do anything at the uh, in combat. Um, then the final choice you make, as I said, is the uh, the master path. And the master path is sort of, you know, a gilding of the lily uh, or providing a little, uh, well, one of two things, either further specializing uh, into what you do, you know, so like you can, if you've been playing a uh, magician who went into wizard and happened to specialize in, say, time spells, you could pick Chronomancer as your master path. And then that will give you extra ways of being awesome with your time spells and then give you some special ability that is very time related. Every one of the schools in the book has a similar specialization. So those are things like conjurer, 
Um, what else here? Conjurer, Diviner, uh, Exorcist, uh, Hexer, Hydromancer. And then in addition to that, there are a ton of more martial-oriented uh, things. And those can range from like Acrobat and Avenger to like Diplomat, uh, Duelist, Engineer, Gunslinger, you know, Jack of all trades, uh, Miracle Worker, Myrmidon, which is like a big tough, you know, uh, defending type character, Sharpshooter, Templar, Weapon Master, uh, and I'm not going to go through the whole list because there's just a ton of them here. But in addition to that, at your master path, you can choose to go and pick one of the expert paths. So uh, let's say that you're playing a character who uh, went from um, Rogue into Thief. Uh, and then at the end of that, you're like, you know, I think I'd like to have a little bit of wizard too. I don't want to go into one of the master paths. I don't want to, I want to get the general abilities I get as a wizard. You can go back and pick wizard, your expert path, and then you will get two of those abilities instead of all three of them. And then at um, uh, a certain level, I, what the, I think it's level eight when you get from your expert path, you choose which of your expert paths you get that ability from. So it's, um, it, like I said, it's a lot of uh, versatility. And as a player... Uh, that's one of the most fun things in this because uh, like you do get to make some choices with each of these expert paths. So, uh, some of them, are, I should say all the paths, the expert paths and the master paths. The expert paths in particular, you do get to have some choice uh, beyond just like what school of magic you're going to learn a spell from. Um, but they're not, not every one of them has that. Some have just stipulated you get X, Y, Z from this path and that's, that's it. Uh, at the different levels, similar to how you know classes work in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, not not Path Pathfinder does give you a lot more versatility, uh, but this doesn't have that level of customization in it. The majority of your sort of creative um, exercise is going to be in the four axes of your uh, ancestry, your novice path, your expert path, and then your uh, master path. Uh, and even though, now that, that, that might seem like it's a fairly regimented, like, oh, fuck, well, every, you know, uh, warrior character is going to be the same, or every dwarven warrior fighter is going to be the same. But in practice, it really doesn't feel that way, uh, in particular because of the way the skill system works. Um, because the professions define your characters as professions, um, not only does it mean that your each character is getting a different, has different sort of um, strengths at the table than what others do, uh, I also find that it informs the gameplay a lot too. Uh, so as an example, in uh, my campaign that I played, uh, Vigdis was a slave. So there were a ton of times, uh, he was a thrall technically, which is still a slave, but um, I use that a lot of times as a way of uh, a story reason for getting, I mean, to, as a mechanical reason to get a boon, but also to sort of inject some kind of... Um, aspect of uh, of my role playing. Uh, for instance, there was a another character in the game who started off as a prostitute. And she became a witch and a very powerful one at that. And the characters had a really strong connection. That's uh, It was my buddy Steve who, who played it. So hi, Steve, uh, if you uh, happen to watch this. Um, and uh, my character ended up seeing the potential. Uh, there was a, a option that came up in the course of the campaign where Abby could have become uh, taking the place of, Abby was the other character, taking the place of this very powerful um, uh, creature who was like a, you know, like a Doctor Strange type, you know, Sorcerer Supreme type thing, but you become this character and then you're sort of stuck doing that for the rest of your life. You're immortal, but as soon as you stop doing that, you die. Um, and Vigdas, my character, sort of realized like, Jesus, wait, like this isn't giving her access to power. This is enslaving her again. She just got free of, you know, being beholden to the prostitute, by the, to the uh, brothel and owned by these characters. And um, then he get forward, you know, stepped forward. And uh, it, no one else in the party really wanted to take this role on, but it was clear that it was an important part of the campaign. So my character did. And like, I would never have considered doing that had I not had uh, that. So that's one really interesting way that I think that uh, the professions really, even though you're not, you know, uh, you're not making um, a lot of different distinctions between characters with the same uh, ancestry and novice path and expert path, um, you still can have a lot of uh, um, customization uh, or have a different flavor from each of your characters. Uh, a second example I'll give you from my campaign, uh, my buddy Steve, different Steve, um, hello Steve, if you watch this, 
Uh, he's playing a character who is a changeling who disguises herself as a dwarf, and she's had it as a background that she was a fisherman, or woman, I should say. So she was a fisherwoman, and this has become a recurring part of uh, the campaign, too. Like, they keep, uh, Steve always remembers that she's got a boat, and she's able to sail, and, uh, uh, and he ended up uh, early on in our campaign uh, interpreting one of her spells, this this uh, it's like an auger type thing where he gets to you know cast the spell and then he gets to ask me one or two yes or no questions, uh, and he decided because of her background that it was uh, piscomancy. He was she was reading the entrails of fish, and uh, that's become you know one of the recurring elements of the uh, of the game, and that's awesome. You know, and it is a way that would distinguish her character from another changeling um i think she went changeling magician artificer in that uh, in this game artificer is this very very cool uh expert path where you you're kind of like a, a magical improving uh engineer uh you get to you know you learn spells and whatnot uh but you also um have this bag of like magical gears and cogs and shit that you can use to create certain things from uh, like objects from up to a certain uh, gold value. Um, I, that actually one of the guys in our, uh, in Jared's game played uh, an artificer as well. And it was awesome. Like that level of uh, be able to improv your, your different um, uh, expressions of that, uh, you know, that gear pool is, is phenomenal. It's really, really cool ability. Um, but anyway, that's getting back to the, you know, uh, just the, the actual design, um, I find that's part of the fun. You know, I like when there's a game, uh, that when a game gives you um, theory crafting things to do as a player between sessions. Uh, the DM will always have things to do between sessions, regardless of whatever game you're running, because the DM's got to plan the campaign and, you know, plan the adventure and figure out what the adversaries are going to be. Um, the players don't always necessarily have some sort of, I mean, apart from thinking about what's going to happen next time, they don't really get to do any other sort of planning uh, unless there is some, you know, theory crafting uh, abilities. And this is a really, really great game for that. Uh, it's awesome to think of like, well, if I built my character into this expert path and then this master path, he would look like this, but maybe I want to go this way instead. And, um, and it's great. Like, I mean, I, I, uh, it's one of the most fun things. Uh, I, uh, as a DM, you don't really see that a lot. And uh, when I played it, I really came to appreciate just how cool that is and how much fun it is. The other thing is, is because there, this uh, game uh, at default is run in a set series of adventures from zero to, you know, 10, you get to see that advancement in the course of the campaign. You know, there's not a lot of, uh, I would say, you know, a very, very uh, large minority or small minority of the, uh, d d or Pathfinder games that are played will ever go through level 1 to level 20. You know, so even though you can theorycraft your character up to a certain point, the likelihood of that character seeing the table is fairly remote. That is not the case in this game. You know, you will see your character advance if you run the character that way. Um, and that's really, really great, you know, uh, because you get to see the character you had envisioned. And it's it's great. It's, it's so much fun uh, to actually see that stuff in play. And the game holds up mechanically very, very well over the course of those levels. It remains dangerous and threatening and scary. You know, it's very easy to see a, a, an encounter suddenly go sideways for you. So it maintains that horror, you know, first, then fantasy second uh, element. Um, but it does provide you with, um, you know, a lot of really interesting choices to make as a player in, in the course of that campaign. Um, another thing I, I should mention, too, is that as the characters advance they feel like they advance out more than up in the sense that you get access to more abilities and more neat things you can bring to the table rather than just, you know, now my X does Y amount of damage. Um, your damage will go up, uh, you know, in, in terms of your spells or your, uh, your attacks or, or whatever. Uh, but the overall feeling is that you've got more kind of neat tricks you get to bring to the table. And that's awesome. Um, and it doesn't ever get to the point where it is unmanageable. Uh, you know, like I, now I wasn't playing a spellcasting character, so I, I can't speak to that, but for my character, I could fit everything I needed on one character sheet on like one page, uh, a word document that had all my abilities on it. And that was it. So that's great. You know, for a, a non spellcasting character, that was easy. A spellcasting character would maybe be two pages. You could have all like full text from all your spells, uh, all the rules for them and what, whatnot. 
two pages at max. So that's, again, a really great way of managing the bloat of things that a player needs to keep track of. You're never going to have cool abilities that you forget about just because you've got so many other things to track. Um, so that's great. And I guess maybe as a, in support of that, in my campaign, uh, because I started the campaign with one player and then expanded to two, uh, we have five player, five characters, I should say, that are played by two different players. And both those guys are able to track what their characters can do and use their characters' abilities in an interesting and tactical way without bogging down the game. So that's, um, uh, you know, if a player is able to track that many characters with that many abilities, and in my campaign, we're at level seven right now, six or seven. I can't remember. Um, but in any event, that's um, another plus for it. Um, so what do you do in the campaign? Well, as I said, you know, it's a, uh, it is at default designed to track your character's uh, exposure to the Demon Lord or the, the machinations of the Demon Lord at level zero, and then to finally either defeating him or falling you know, prey to his, his uh, plans at level 10. Uh, so uh, there is a clear story arc that you have there, um, and that's basically what you do is uh, they, they suggest, and I say they, it's, it's Rob Schwab. I shouldn't talk in, in the uh, plural, it's one guy. Rob's advice on this is to... Uh, you know, novice is sort of getting your feet wet and becoming, you know, local heroes. Expert is learning a bit more about what the heck is going on in, in a broader sense. Um, and then master is taking the fight to the demon lord and trying to prevent the end of the world. Um, and that's awesome. As a DM uh, planning your campaign, you can think through the story beats that way. You can think through when do I need to reveal, you know, like in, in my campaign, um, we did, you know, there was some very small, like neighborhood focused stuff, uh, in the, in the novice tier. And then in the expert tier, they learned a little bit more about what's going on and who the major players are. And then just at the cusp of the master tier is when they really got a sense of this is what the plan is. And now what we're doing is playing through seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th level. Emmy, sorry, my dog's very excited. Hey, Emmy, come on. Hey, get down. Sorry. Um, the um yeah so then the seventh eighth ninth and tenth levels they are going out and trying to prevent the the end of the world you know uh and that's the way this that's suggested to be played so um it's great i mean it gives it that sort of strict three-act structure that um you know uh, that is uh, so popular in western literature and uh and it also an easy way to, to uh sort of plan the the longer campaign uh, as a as a dm um, and, uh, the adversaries you will fight in the course of, of your, uh, your game or the adversaries you will use to, to throw against your monster, or your uh, players is pretty much what you would expect from a, uh, a fantasy role-playing game. You know, uh, you have orcs, you have, uh, dwarves, you have, uh, goblins, you have, um, minotaurs, you have dragons, you have demons and, and whatnot, and a bunch of other monsters that you would like shambling mound type things, other types of monsters that you would um that you would recognize from any other game uh to be honest i feel like the the list of monsters in this are very similar to the same monsters i saw in the rules cyclopedia uh a um, basic dungeons and dragons book that provides a summary of uh all, all the you know old beck me okay emmy hey come on cut it out sorry um so anyway, uh, you do have a, a wide variety of um, uh, of the common monsters you would be expecting, but a lot of them have really interesting uh, tweaks to them. Uh, for instance, uh, the what you would recognize as uh, a elemental from uh, Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or similar type games uh, are called genies, and they have a very specific role or place in the cosmology of the world. Like one, um, there isn't an awful lot of um, background material in uh, in the core rulebook uh, let's see there are um, including discussions of cosmology and uh, well, actually there's a decent amount there's about 27 pages worth of uh, background material and um, they provide some really interesting you know kind of uh, spins on a lot of d d tropes so like elves are actually immortal creatures that are part of the Fae. They're the aristocracy, effectively, of the Fae. And they're very different from, like, Tolkien elves or, you know, D&D &D elves or, or whatnot. So it provides a really different, you know, take on them. 
I'll, I'll give you actually an example of uh, the first picture you see of an elf uh, in the game is uh, this charming gent who uh, appears to have just carved an eye out of some poor hapless mortal. Uh, and uh, let's see if we can find the actual image. Um, where it's when they talk about the hidden kingdoms. Um, the art, actually, while I'm finding this thing, I should say the art is just gorgeous in this book. It's very moody. Uh, it's very suits the game. So there's your first time seeing an elf. And one thing with the elves, because they are fairy, uh, they have um, they each have very different um, characteristics as well, very random sort of characteristics. So, for instance, um, one of the characters, one of the players uh, in um, Jared's game played an elf who uh, had kind of like twigs and stuff sticking out of him. He seemed like a, a walking tree almost with a mane of feathers. Um, and that was pretty cool. It was a really neat visual uh, th thing to sort of lock on when you're picturing the character. Um, but uh, anyway, the genies, uh, they have a very specific place in the cosmology. The devils and demons and angels, the uh, ruler of hell is this charmer named um, Diabolus. And this is what Diabolus looks like. This is from one of the supplements. There's a great backstory to him and there's a really terrific surprise about him uh, that appears in one of the source books. Um, there's also uh, a very clear cosmology for death uh, as well. So the, where the, you know, where souls travel to the underworld. Um, I won't go into a lot of the specifics of that. I'll save that for you to, to you know, find in the book because I imagine it's not a big deal breaker one way or the other if this is something that you might want to pick up or, or not. Um, but I'll, I'll say that the cosmology is remarkably tight. Like everything fits together very nicely in an interesting and cohesive way. Um, there isn't, you know, the kind of, okay, well, where do I fit X race? Because it doesn't, you know, there doesn't seem to be space for it. Um, an example, uh, I'll give you a uh, final one as a uh, an interesting twist is the orcs in this. So the orcs are actually a magically created race. Um, there is a, an empire that uh, at the start of the, uh, of the default campaign, the empire has collapsed because the orc king killed the last emperor. Um, and uh, that empire uh, originally was threatened by these, um, these half giants called uh, Jotun. And this is oh, what the Jotun look like. They're big, kind of like frost giants in D&D, but not quite as big. There's some Jotun there. Let me see if my camera will actually adjust. There we go. Um, so these Jotun used to raid the empire all the time. And uh, one emperor, after his son was killed, finally had enough of it, put together a massive army, marched down to uh, Blotham, uh, which is where the, the uh, Jotun lived, and effectively you know, create or uh, perpetrated a genocide or at least a near genocide, nearly wiped out them and then brought back a ton of them in chains. They were then turned over to this powerful warlock who used magic and, you know, alchemy and a bunch of other crap to transform them into a slave species, uh, which are the orcs. So the orcs are these slightly bigger than human size, muscular beasts that are just, um, you know, they're built to, uh, to be, their race was built to be slaves. But recently they've cast off their shackles uh, and that's cool. I mean, that's a really cool uh, twist on the typical, you know, just, you know, killing whatever hordes that you find in other games. Um, there's a justified reason why the orcs, uh, you know, hate uh, humans and other species uh, because they were bred as slaves. And then in, um, you find out in one of the supplements that uh, the reason that uh, the orc, one of the reasons why the orcs finally, you know, had this revolt and why, the uh, the orc king killed the emperors because he found out that their the plan that they had the retirement plan they had for orcs which was they would send them up north into the northern reaches and they would get attractive land and they would live out their lives in uh, in in relative peace um, that was the retirement plan they proposed for even orc you know performed his service and or her service uh, that's what they would get. But it turns out in practice, what would happen is they would send them north and then they would kill them on the way and then grind them up into gruel or food that was then fed back to the orcs. So uh, when the orcs found that out, they obviously didn't take well to that. They killed the 
uh, the emperor, and now the capital, a place called Sacris, is uh, is in ruins. Um, so anyway, that's that's the the twist on orcs. As you can probably tell from my reaction, I love the backstory uh, for for orcs. I think it's a really interesting uh, twist. That's a great source of adventure material too, uh, either as a motivator for your characters as orcs or as NPCs if your characters have to deal with or your players have to deal with uh, with orcs in it. Um, it also allows you to sort of play up both stereotypes of like the raging you know uh, savages uh, or the sort of you know wharf-ish noble savages that you, uh, you know, that, that the Klingons from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation are presented as. So you get to have it both ways in this setting, uh, which is is great. Um, in terms of the, um, the monsters available in the core book too, there are, let me see here, uh, about 40, no, 50 pages of monsters, but they cram a ton of stuff in there. Um, they also provide you with some templates, uh, just like in third edition D and D and in Pathfinder, there are templates you can apply to your monsters to, to twist them slightly, to provide a slightly different feel to them at the table. Um, also you, you, um, uh, your, your monsters will for the most part use the same, uh, spells, uh, spell casting mechanics as the, um, as a player characters w will. So that means that all of the different spells that are available to players are also available to, um, your monsters. Um, I have learned that, unfortunately, the hard way because uh, we fought a lich in um, our campaign, in, in the campaign that Jared ran for us, and the lich was the scariest fucking thing I've ever fought in any role-playing game. Uh, my character was effectively the meat shield tank type guy, and I spent most of my time um, being teleported partway into a wall through this really horrific spell called Fuse. Um, and it sucked, and I took a shit ton of damage, and it kept me basically down. I did nothing but get healed by one of the other characters in it. Um, so it wasn't an awful lot of fun for me, but by doing that and keeping it occupied, it allowed everyone else to actually take this damn thing down. Um, but the reason I mentioned that is because when it came time for one of my players in another game to, uh, to pick a spell, my experience with Fuse... It led to me recommending to him because he was playing a space and time type character to take a look at that spell because it was really really effective. So uh, in the same way that as a DM you would see players you make effective use of spells and then steal that idea for your monsters, you can do it the other way too if you're uh, a player who then becomes a DM, or uh, rather the uh, uh, the other way around. Um, so yeah, so there's just a lot of material. I guess um, in terms of what's in the book. Uh, let's let's go very briefly through here. So um, one thing I'll say is that I'll, I'll repeat. I suppose there is a ton of material in this book. Um, there are rules for traps. There's great rules for monsters. There's rules for uh, overland travel. There's rules for you know scaling the difficulty of encounters. There's random item generation rules for magic items. Magic items are all unique in this game. There's no like plus one boon sword or, you know, plus one boon armor. Uh, there are, they're always randomly generated and they're awesome. Like they're very story feel, filled. And uh, if you, uh, in one my campaign, I was using some of them to sort of fill in stuff that the characters, you know, recovered that used to be there. So there's one character who had had a bunch of stuff taken from him by the Goblin King. And it was really cool seeing what a lot of the stuff was and then trying to, you know, improv what the um, the abilities are. Um, another thing I like about it is that those random items uh, became a challenge for me as a DM to figure out how I was going to fit it into the story arc. So, uh, for instance, in um, in my campaign, I mentioned that the fairy play a big role in the, um, in the Shadow of the Demon Lord theme. Um, in one of our first adventures, uh, I rolled up, it was a random scabbard. It was a scabbard that also would sing when you, you know, compelled it to, which seems silly. Uh, but when I was looking through the materials for the fairies, the scariest monster for the fairies, which actually is in a, um, a, uh, a supplement called Terrible Beauty, uh, is this thing called the Jabberwock, you know, the thing from Alice in Wonderland. Um, that creature has a, 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 an ability where it jabbers and causes distractions for it. So when I had sort of, the next time when uh, we met and I described what that magic item looked like, I had a jabber walk on there and I decided at that point, all right, when they reach, you know, the end stage 
and face the Jabberwock, this thing is specifically designed to sing to counteract that ability. Uh, and they've used it a couple of times in, in the past, but they haven't quite put two and two together to see that yet, but that's going to be awesome. And that's a random element that was introduced thanks to the magic you know, item uh, rules. So yeah, it's another thing that I really, uh, I really, really love and makes each campaign unique in this. But anyway, I was talking about what's in the game. So um, there's obviously a lot of room spent on um, uh, character creation in this because there's just so many options that you have. Uh, I'll give you a quick little peek here. I'm going to screw up the lighting here of what the, uh, the game looks like. So again, there's some really awesome moody art of a, uh, a changeling character. Uh, under your professions thing, there's a little picture of a grave digger. Uh, and one of the things I, I do really like about the art in the game too is it's a mix of, um, you know, cool character poses stuff uh, and, you know, sort of, you know, snapshots of uh, like vignettes of your day-to-day -day life and adventuring vignettes. So there's pictures of adventurers doing cool things like facing off against monsters or, you know, looting a body or trying to, you know, defuse a trap or something like that. Uh, but there are also um, some pictures in here that just... Um, they give you a sense of what the dark world is is like, uh, and I like that. Like that, giving as a DM, I, I like seeing what the slow beats are, are like. You know what uh, what the downtime is. One of the the design themes for the uh, game too is to allow the game to be what you need for your for your game. Um, that's a bit of word salad there, so let me try and unpack that. What I mean by that is that uh, they provide you very very brief descriptions of what the different countries are like or what the different uh, towns or, or whatever are like. But it's expected that there is going to be a, a large degree of you filling in what you need for your campaign. Um, the first uh, campaign that they released for it was something called Tales from the De Tales of the Demon Lord. Uh, and it provided a setting called Crossings, uh, which then became the sort of the point you would always go back to in the course of that campaign. And it would take you from zero to, to ten. But it left a lot of stuff very open for you to fill in. And uh, I like that, you know, like, I mean, um, I'm at the stage in my life and uh, where I don't want to have to read through a shit ton of stuff just to understand what the world is. Um, I want to be able to get just some brief ideas and then just improv it at the table. Um, and that's what this game supports. So there's nothing to, to prevent you from, you know, pursuing uh, or purchasing a bunch of the supplements and using those to help flush out what's, you know, what the kingdoms are like, but you'll never see in this game the kind of detail that you see in like uh, Freeport or Forgotten Realms where like you're going to know the name of the tavern at the corner of X and Y Street. Uh, that's just not what the game is about. It's much more about, uh, I mean, there's not, nothing to prevent you from running something like that, but you got to do the, the work on that. Uh, I'll get back to Freeport, Freeport actually at the end of the review as well because there's something worth saying about uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord and that. Um, the setting that he provides in the core book, um, it can allow you to run a wide variety of different sort of fantasy tropes. You can play like pioneer adventurers on the edge of civilization. You can provide, you can play, you know, um, crusaders in a desert kingdom. You can play very high magic type stuff where you're all playing weird races. Uh, not necessarily in the core book, uh, but it, well, no, even in the core book, like you could easily have a group of misfits that are all, you know, clockworks or goblins or, you know, changelings, some of the more unusual races. And then the more you go into the products, the, the uh, supplements, um, the more you'll find other really weirdo races. Like our, uh, play, you know, in my campaign, uh, we have a changeling, a clockwork, a revenant, which is a uh, a human who is, uh, or rather, a uh, mortal species that has come back to life after dying. Uh, we have a goblin weir raven uh, who was cursed by the goblin king, uh, and then we have a human as well. So, uh, when you get beyond the core book into some of the supplements, you can really find some esoteric character concepts. There's rules for playing uh, lizard men in this. There's rules for playing ghouls. Uh, there's rules for playing centaurs. There's rules for playing Jotun, you know. Uh, the the options for playing the characters uh, are incredibly um, uh, incredibly vast. Uh, and, but they, none of them break, they, they don't feel, or I should say, it doesn't feel like they break the game, though. 
uh, you know, the game remains playable and remains uh, balanced uh, throughout. Uh, so long as you're you're keeping an eye on that potential, you know, uh, combat uselessness uh, that I mentioned before. Um, there's uh, a brief section on running the game as well, which is is good, and it talks about more high level structuring of the campaign. You know, a, a railroad type campaign or a linear campaign versus more of a tiered or structured campaign. Um, and uh, then it provides, as I said, the uh, the very very awesome bestiary and. For my money, I think that this may be uh, the most comprehensive uh, fantasy role-playing game since the Rule Cyclopedia. Um, this can give you just you know uh, tons and tons and tons of time of gameplay and terrific replay. Um, if you change up where you're setting the game, what the themes are, uh, you know, what the, uh, in terms of the Demon Lord. You can have a very, very different, um, different campaign in, in a very, very different setting. That's about a different thing each time you decide to, to run a new campaign. Um, so that's it's it's a really, really uh, it, like I said, it's a, one of my favorite uh, role playing games. I love playing it. I love running it. Uh, so I, I, you know, uh, obviously my my recommendation comes or this comes as a recommended uh, uh, product. Now, uh, in terms of downside to it, so the Combat, as much as you do have a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different abilities, uh, you do have some ability to choose. I'm about to, to refute something I was going to say. I was going to say there's not a lot of a variety in combat, but that's actually not true at all. Because you, in the default rules, you have different options you can take where, uh, you know, you can make a lunging attack and attack a little further than you normally could. Or you could do a defensive attack where you're going to... Um, you know, take a bane on your attack, but then the attacker also has a bane attacking you. Um, that is expanded in one of the supplements that I'm, I am going to talk about uh, in this review, um, where you, you get to do other things like lunging or, you know, you can try and knock people down or stuff like that. And um, the re I find that really great because it means that the fighter types get a lot of different interesting sort of options in combat without having to spend character resources or like character creation resources to gain access to them and by that i mean like uh, like one of the criticisms i have of uh pathfinder is that unless you've got a feat in one of your different combat maneuvers which is like the grapple or like you know dirty trick or the little things that you would improvise the, um that often are just narrative things that uh that can provide mechanical bonuses. Pathfinder, there's a deterrent. Unless you've got a, spa, a feat, you spend a character creation resource on a, on a feat uh, selection, you're going to suck at it. Like Mechanically, you'll just be awful at it. This game allows you to, so, to sort of do all those things. You can just do them at default. Um, and that's great. I mean, it, it makes for really fun um, combats. Like I, playing uh, as a player, um, I found that I probably half of the time I would do my attacks and then the other half of the time I'd be thinking of neat ways to use my character's size to try and do other things to help the party. Like for instance, tossing a corrupt priest into a brazier, you know, or a brazier that was burning. Uh, she was, in fairness, she had it coming because she did want to kill all of us. But, uh, but yeah, so my, um, I did get, I think I got a point of corruption from doing that too. Um, but anyway, um, that was really cool. You know, there was lots of, of ways that, um, I guess that's the other thing too, is the way they model size in this is a really fun mechanic. So like, because my character was, my Jotun was bigger than what other things were, I'd always get a boon on my uh, attempts to try and, you know, uh, muscle uh, down other creatures. Um, and similarly, they would uh, get a bane if they tried to do the same to me. Um, you factor that in with the fact that I also had a higher strength meant that mechanically at the table, I felt more powerful and stronger than what a lot of the smaller things were. So it was great. I mean, it was very satisfying to, you know, waste, not waste, but to spend my turn racing in and slamming my shield into someone and knocking them down, uh, which was just a narrative thing. It wasn't on my character sheet. Um, then to just, you know, go in and, and do damage. So the character, the, the combat, it can be very dynamic uh, that way. Um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting variety in the abilities that the different monsters have too. So um, it's never boring. 
uh, when you're fighting against different monsters, they feel different mechanically. Uh, a, an example of that is uh, there's a creature called the Fungal Giant, which I've seen a lot of play in uh, in my campaign. Um, to be honest, what it reminds me of is a character, or not a character, a creature that you fought in World of Warcraft. Um, and, uh, so I may be making an obscure pull here, but uh, in the second expansion, uh, sorry, first expansion for World of Warcraft in um, uh, Burning Crusade, uh, you went to the Outlands, and one of the places you went was this place called Zangar Marsh. And in Zangar Marsh, there are these giant, these giants, these, these enormous sort of uh, fungal creatures that loped around, and then as you attacked them, they would burst out these uh, you know, kind of cl uh, cloud spores that would either give you a debuff or it would hurt you. I can't remember. I think it was a debuff. It wasn't a hurt. But in any event, that's what the fungal giants in this game effectively are. They're in the core book, and then what happens is every time you do physical damage to these things, it bursts out this cloud of smoke that will poison you. It's, it's these like corrosive spores. Um, that became a recurring, because it fit with the whole fairy thing, that became a, a recurring character in this. And I love that I saw the characters respond to that appropriately when they would encounter one. They'd be like, shit, keep it at a distance, you know? And even the, the um, uh, because I had fucked up with the rules earlier on and thought it was poison, not corrosion, I had early in the campaign established that the uh, the spore wouldn't affect uh, a non-living creature like a, a revenant or a um, uh, clockwork. So very quickly, what they would do is they would use the clockwork to charge in and pin this thing down uh, in melee while the range guys and the spellcasters got back and you know would try and peck this thing down. But uh, but it was just great. I mean, it was a really really a very small thing, but it provided a ton of uh, thematic flavor for those uh, monsters. And there's uh, a ton of that in each of the monsters that are in the core book too. So it really is, uh, you know, it, it provides a some mechanical assistance to that narrative um, description that you'll be doing as a DM. Um, so that's sort of what's in the book. I mean, I, I've uh, I sort of, you know, gone uh, on a, a bit of a uh, tangent a couple of times in that, but uh, that's what's in the book. You know, there's uh, um, th a bunch of stuff on character creation, which gives you a, a, a massive variety of different options you can pick. Um, there are a huge variety of different uh, spells you can pick as characters. Uh, there are a wide variety of great monsters uh, that are in here too. Um, they also do a really clever thing where they will just provide specific uh, or rather like default stats for uh, say animals. They'll give you a small, medium, large, huge animals, and then it leaves it to you to sort of add flavor for that. They don't necessarily need to give you, you know, um, different stats for hawks versus falcons versus ravens versus whatever. They say small animal and give it flight um, because really it doesn't matter that much mechanically whether there's a huge distinction between the two of them. Uh, similarly, there is just a broad category of monster. Now, they still give you a, a ton of specific uh, monsters to use too, but if you want to, you know, um, if you just want to have some big scary thing that you're going to add some description for yourself, um, you just go with the monster stats. Use those rather than trying to, you know, wait for the for the um, the game to tell you what a manticore or whatever, you know, would be. Although there is a manticore in here. So um, the monster, let me see if I can, let's see what uh, they say in the book. Uh, a monster is a category that comprises a variety of strange and unnatural creatures. Some are created through conjuration spells, while many other lurk in the wild. Um, monsters usually resemble ordinary animals, but have some weird physical trait. So, you want your stats for your owl bear. Uh, this is where you would be looking for your uh, owl bear type character for it. Um, the uh, the other, I guess, interesting thing by doing it as in that way is. Monster translates to what you're summoning with your conjuration school spells, and animal is what you're summoning with your nature, I believe, school spells. Could be animal, maybe. Anyway, um, so that's that's really uh, great. Uh, there are rules for like um, hordes uh, as well too. So if you want to use like a swarm uh, creature, there's there's ways of modeling that with a template uh, in here. Um, and the final thing I'll, I'll mention too is that uh, a lot of creatures have a, uh, either they cause fear or they cause terror. And that will manifest in your characters gaining um, either uh, insanity, uh, well, it, it, an insanity and then potentially 
you know, being terrified for a certain period of time. And the way that terror is effectively modeled is you suffer banes for a certain number of rounds. And that can be a huge pain in the ass. You know, like as a player, it, it provides, again, great mechanical reinforcement of the themes of the story part or the narrative part of the game. Um, and I guess that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why I really love this game so much is that the mechanics and the thematic elements that are in the narrative go together so very, very well. You know, there aren't parts of the of playing the game where, you know, one of them jars you out of the other. Um, you always feel like the, uh, the rules uh, augment and support the, the narr narrative experience you're going for with this game. So, uh, so that's really, really great. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, uh, I guess not just great, that is a successful implementation of game mechanics to support the world that you're trying to build. Um, the one, so there's one downside. So, um, I love almost everything about this, every design decision in this game, I, I thoroughly enjoy. The only one I don't is the way that you handle spells at default. So the way that the spells are handled at default is every time, you know, you gain a, uh, a new, uh, I shouldn't say every time, in certain paths, you will gain access to new spells or new schools. You'll gain your new spell or new school, and sometimes your power ability will go up. Your power, power starts at zero, but if you're in a spell casting path, that will slowly inch its way up until you hit level or power five when you can grab your fifth level power spells. Um, so uh, the way that your you control how many spells you can uh, cast in every uh, round or, or every you know day is by your power. Uh, your power will tell you how many times you can cast each of those spells per day. So it's not like the Vancian magic in uh, older versions of D&D, &D, um, but it does require a lot of tracking of specific spells. And I imagine that some of the game decision or the design dis thought behind that is so that you know, if you, you don't get one damaging spell and then you use that every time, right? You you are forced to like, I'll use my magic wrench the three times that I can use it and then I'll swap up to my like acid bolt or fire bolt or whatever. And I understand that, but that's, I just really don't like having to track, you know, how many times per day you can cast each spell. I, I do like seeing more variety for the spell casters. Um, that has been remedied in this supplement called Forbidden Rules. Forbidden Rules provides optional rules, uh, a bunch of different optional rules, including a effectively like a mana system for spellcasting. There are also great uses for, uh, oh, one thing I should mention too. So there's another um, feature in the game called Fortune. And what Fortune is, is basically, it's like action points in D&D &D and every other game that has action points or like force points in, um, uh, Star Wars from uh, Fantasy Flight or feed points from um, uh, Iron Kingdoms. It's a way that players can mitigate the vagaries of, uh, of the dice rolls. Uh, this has a slightly more uh, interesting uh, spin on it in the sense that you can spend fortune to just succeed. So you don't get a great success on that, but you can just spend fortune to succeed. So if you've got fortune, uh, your character will always have the option, uh, or you as a player will always have the option to just say, I succeed at this. And that's really cool. I mean, uh, you gain fortune back by the usual sort of, you know, vague DM stuff where you, you know, good role playing or a great success or, or whatever. You can also use it to add a boon to your role before you make the role or to spend your fortune to give someone else two boons. Um, and I've seen that used a lot when I was playing. Uh, and that's great. I think that's a really great, um, it's a great way of, of encouraging uh, teamwork. Uh, Forbidden Rules introduces more varieties or more uses for that, including things like manage, you know, reducing damage you take, uh, which uh, games like Iron Kingdoms and uh, Bennies in, in Savage Worlds, those can be spent to sort of, you know, when there's a, an unexpected damage spike and, and you're going from, you know, useful combatant to dead passive corpse, uh, spending those resources can allow you to, to do that. And it, that's a, a, an optional rule that I use in my campaigns now because my characters my, or my players don't want to see the characters die left, right, and center, right? Um, but the magic rules in particular are the reason uh, that I love, love, love this supplement. The supplement also provides more options at uh, for combat maneuvers uh, at the table, and I love that as well. Uh, the game at a default 
um, assumes, not assume, it doesn't require necessarily, but it does assume that you're going to use some kind of battle mat or like, um, you know, a, a, a thing like Roll20 uh, to, uh, to, to track where the positioning is. Forbidden Rules provides you with a narrative abstracted combat rules, which is what uh, Jared used in the, the campaign I played in, uh, and it played really well. Um, I was used to that type of combat from uh, the Star Wars games from uh, Fantasy Flight and from Conan from uh, Modiphius. So it was a natural fit for me to, um, you know, to, to play in that. But um, the rules in, for, in Forbidden Rules, uh, they model the amount of mana you have based on uh, how many uh, spells you know ver and how many, what your, your power attribute is. Um, and that's, uh, I found that that was a, that's what I've been using since that book came out in PDF, uh, and I like it much more than the default system. Apart from that caveat on the uh, magic system, I, I just love everything about this game. I, I find that it's a, a really, really fun game to, to run. It's very easy to improv stuff on the fly. More often than not, when I first started running it, I was statting out monsters in uh, Roll20 to make sure I had them in there and whatnot. I have found that I do not need that, not at all. It's so much easier to just run the monsters, you know, um, uh, straight out of the book uh, or one of the supplements. Uh, it's as easy as it is to just, um, you know, to set them up in the uh, and have them run that way. So uh, it makes it very DM friendly. Uh, you can improv stuff very, very easily if your players take you in a direction you didn't expect, which is, of course, always, which players always do. So it's, it was really, really great. Uh, and, and that's I, I, I keep saying great, but uh, it it's one of the reasons why I find it such a, a pleasure to to prep and run the the game. Um, so who's this game for? Um, Shadow of the Demon Lord is uh, for 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 DMs uh, is for DMs who want to run a dark horror thing closer to say like Dark Souls, the 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 role of the video game. Uh, Something like maybe Game of Thrones in terms of its level of lethality, but with more uh, a more present fantasy kind of feel to it. Um, or for someone who really misses the heyday of Warhammer fantasy. Uh, there is, at the time of recording, there's a new Warhammer fantasy role-playing game that will be coming out from uh, uh, Cubicle 7, um, which seems to be trying to capture that, that feel again. But... Shadow of the Demon Lord is a really great middle ground between uh, the sort of class-based system that D&D is uh, ver uh, versus the, um, the more profession and dark fantasy elements of, um, of Warhammer fantasy. Uh, if you're a fan of either of those things, if you're a fan of Ravenloft too, you probably would find a lot to like uh, in... Um, uh, and Ravenloft, I mean the setting, not necessarily the adventure that was published for 5th edition. Uh, you probably would find a lot to love in this as well. Um, also, if you wanted to uh, customize your world, too, if you wanted something that was a more gentle advancement but still saw your characters go from zero to hero, um, this would be a great game for that, too. Um, at the time of recording, there are two other settings that are supported by supplemental products. Uh, one of them is a very interesting Mad Max kind of end-of-the-world setting called Godless. Uh, this is an excellent supplement if you want to run kind of a D&D meets Mad Max kind of feel. Uh, there's some great stuff in here. Uh, there's not quite enough to really get a good, a full sense of what the setting is like here. But again, keeping with the, the core book where it's expected that you're going to fill in the gaps, um, it's a terrific resource for that. Uh, the second default campaign that is uh, supported for this is Freeport, uh, the setting that was published by uh, Green Ronin uh, for, I guess, the last 10 years-ish. Uh, they have, at time of recording, there is the Freeport Companion, which provides just a ton of great new material in here uh, that's easily adaptable to any Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, uh, campaign. Uh, a bunch of new... Um, um, Ancestries as well in there, and they have uh, adapted the three uh, campaigns or the three adventures that were originally published that created the the Freeport uh, campaign. There's Death in Freeport, uh, Terror in Freeport, and Madness in Freeport. Uh, I cannot speak to how well these translate the original material into uh, 
Shadow of the Demon Lord because I've never owned or run or played in the original Freeport ones, but uh, they're pretty good. Uh, these versions, at least, are pretty good, and these provide uh, probably the best path uh, from 0 to 10 of any of the books that they've published so far. Uh, their first supplement uh, campaign was this one called Tales of the Demon Lord, uh, which is a, a perfectly functional product, but this one did not... Um, I think that they hadn't realized just how lethal the combat system was at the time this came out. So there are uh, your second or third adventure in this is this dungeon crawl that's insanely lethal for your players. Like not even in a fun kind of way, like a just woefully overpowered. Um, I'll talk about maybe that in in greater detail in a um, in a later uh, video or a later review. But those are the settings that are supported by this already is Freeport, the Godless setting, as well as this. But there's certainly more than enough material that a creative DM, and there's a lot of fan material too, where you can create your own thing. Um, I understand there's a great fan resource for using this to run the Dark Sun setting. Dark Sun is one of my favorite D&D settings ever. It came out at the right time where it really captured my young, you know, uh, uh, um, my young eye, and I just stuck with it since I've loved that setting. Uh, this is a terrific game for you uh, simulating uh, that the the grim brutality of uh, of that setting. Um, if you are a DM who likes supplements, and I mean who doesn't, uh, at the time of recording, uh, I am missing one thing because it's on its way for me. But there are print on demand books that are here. These are the different uh, 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 a collection of the books that are out at present. Um, so there is just, and this doesn't include uh, the weekly releases, which are either new setting material or resource material or new adventures. Uh, this does not, I, I've uh, printed and bound a bunch of the supplemental material, but this is basically the first year's worth of stuff here, you know, and um, as you can see, like there's just a lot of material. And one thing I would, I would say about the uh, core book as well, because there is so much in there, uh, it does not repeat itself. So it'll mention what a rule is in one place, and then if you can't remember where it is, good luck trying to find it again. There is a, uh, a very good um, glossary in here, which will help you try and find things, but if you just are flipping through and trying to find something without using the glossary, you may have some difficulty finding that one time they tell you how fortune works or how armor works or, or something like that. Um, but on the upside, because they are making such a, a good use of space, that's carried over into their products. So every one of the products has just a ton of great stuff in it. Uh, they are quite, um, you know, some seem quite thin, but there is they make what they um, lose or lack in page length. They make up for in quality. Um, the last specific uh, supplement I will mention. Uh, is the, um, the Demon Lord's Companion. This was the first supplement that came out for the game. And uh, the reason I wanted to mention is because uh, everything else that is in the game really is optional. Like, it really is stuff that you, you, it just it gives you more stuff you can bring to your table or more things you can, um, you can include. They were all designed sort of on their own. They're not something that was, you know, oh, I wish I could fit it in the book, but I couldn't quite fit it, so I had to trim it. Um, that's what this material is. Robert uh, Schwab has said that uh, the Demon Lord's Companion was material that was they hoped would be included in the core rulebook, uh, but they had to cut it for space. So it um, it has some really great stuff in it, uh, including you know uh, rules for expert paths that effectively model like the monk from D and D or the um, uh, psychic uh, or the swashbuckler, you know, or the warden. Uh, the the sort of you know primal influenced um, uh, tanky type class. Um, I of the different supplements, the the companion is is hands down one of my favorites because it has just a, a terrific amount of new material that synchronize uh, that that uh, syncs up nicely with the the core book. Uh, it also has halflings in it, and halflings in that are um, are great are, are really uh, an interesting and um, and viable option for players. They're not sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a choice that people would only make if they wanted to recreate the Hobbit or, or whatever. They're, they're a genuinely interesting uh, uh, ancestry to pick. Um, so 
Who is this for? That's who this would be for for DMs. There's tons of different uh, implementations you can make. Um, in terms of players, if uh, you know, if you are someone who really wants a you know uh, complete uh, freedom and creativity to create specifically the character you want without any restrictions along the lines of like a GURPS type character creation or a Savage Worlds type character creation, you, you may find this a little more restrictive because it is a class-based game. But in as far as class-based games go, this offers you not the level of um, crunchy sort of dial twisting that you find in uh, like say Pathfinder where you're, you have tons and tons and tons of options that give you very small incremental changes. Uh, this is for players who want a lot of different options but aren't super fussed about a plus one here or a plus one there. All your decisions that you make in this in terms of your schools of your magic or the uh, talent abilities that you choose for certain uh, paths like the rogue or the fighter um, and uh, or just the, the paths themselves are very thematic. You know, they are things that will make your character feel different at the table. Um, and that is a ton of fun. As I said, like the the theory crafting element of uh, player uh, creation or character creation in this is something I really, really enjoyed as a player. Uh, and uh, I have enjoyed when I've had to, you know, put together pre-gens for, um, uh, for one shots or things like that. So if you're the kind of player who, um, you know, wants to have that level of, uh, of choice uh, and is comfortable with a uh, class type system, this would be a great pick for you. You know, it's something to pick up and force your, your DM to run for you. Um, so um, I think that's kind of everything I had to say about the game. Again, it's, it's been a really exhaustive sort of overview and a little, uh, you know, subject to uh, sidetracks as I've been going through this. But as you can likely tell, I mean, this is a, a game that I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy both running and, and playing. Um, I, uh, I also should say, uh, you know, that in uh, Forbidden Rules, they open up the possibility of advancement past 10. So the game doesn't have to end at level 10. Uh, it just changes in terms of what options and what abilities you can pick. Uh, the game still maintains a degree of, of, um, uh, of control over the raw number advancement in it because, you know, you can only gain so many advan uh, attribute ad or ability advancements and only so many you know, other sort of abilities that will increase the amount of damage you do or increase the amount of uh, uh, dice you roll or boons you roll when you attack. Uh, so again, you're still sort of expanding out rather than up. Um, but it, it, they're really, at, I haven't played them yet uh, and I have not run them yet, but uh, my intention is to do that. Uh, so to give you an idea of how easily adaptable the game is, my current plan for my campaign uh, that we've been playing for about a year and, and change now um, is for us to finish up our current arc, uh, you know, with the current theme of the uh, the fairies being corrupted by the demon lord and then maybe ending the world. Assuming my players are able to prevent that, the next thing I want to do is to use the Iron Gods adventure path that had been published for Pathfinder, and I'm going to use that and run that with the same characters using the rules for Advancement Path 10. Because... The characters will not be more significantly more powerful than, say, like low-level superheroes in other games. Um, you don't gain access to world or you know um, plot-breaking abilities uh, that, say, sixth, seventh, eighth-level spells in D and D do. Where suddenly you're like, they can read minds and get answers and break mysteries, or they can teleport anywhere across the globe without you know any difficulty. That shit isn't in this game. It, it remains a dark fantasy, grounded, low magic type setting. There still will feel like real badasses in the, you know, interpersonal encounters, but there isn't the world or uh, campaign or adventure breaking kind of thing. So uh, I am looking forward to exploring that uh, after we finish our, our first uh, sort of campaign arc. But uh, anyway, that's... Um, my very scattered review of uh, an overview, I should say. I really should start calling these overviews rather than reviews because I'm not really, this is me just singing the praises of this game rather than, uh, you know, um, giving it a, a score or anything like that. But uh, those are my thoughts on uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. 
Uh, as always, if you have any uh, comments, uh, questions, uh, or concerns regarding the review or the game, uh, please don't hesitate to leave a, a comment in the comment section, and I will endeavor to respond to it in a timely fashion. Um, I will be following this up at some point with a comprehensive review or survey, I should say, of the different supplements, what you can find in them, uh, you know, what they, who they may be for. But um, the game is, is a huge game at present in the sense that with the uh, options that are available in the supplements, uh, there are a ton of things you can do with this game. Like, I believe that at present there's at least 20 or 25 different ancestries you can choose from. There's a comparable number of expert paths and master paths. So you can imagine that the variety of characters you can create in the course of this, you know, using the full scope of the game is really impressive. Um, so, it, yeah, it, there's just a lot of different things you can do with this game as well. Um, so, anyway, before I just keep uh, singing his praises more, I will call it a quit there. Uh, thanks, as always, for uh, for listening. Um, and again, uh, I would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts of your own, uh, what your experience with Shadow of the Demon Lord was like. Um, war stories uh, are one of the things that uh, gamers love sharing, and I love hearing because it makes me excited to play that game or run that game again. So anyway, thanks for listening. I uh, hope you found this uh, educational uh, and entertaining, and uh, I will see you again soon.